It's the same in schools where the children are put in these categories. Nobody means to, but they have the LGBT group that the kids can join. They have the Black Caribbean kid group that the kids can join. And of course, it's only the Black Caribbean kids that go to that group. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the playground, nobody is friends across religious and racial divides um, and sexual divides. You know, like I just, this is crazy, right? Yeah. Children ought to be friends with each other whoever they are. Like, that's the whole point. The, the, that's what school's meant to do. It's meant to socialize you and make you feel like anyone can be your friend. And I I just, um, uh, the new way of doing things, like anti-racism is racism, right? That's what we need to understand. And it's the same when it comes to anything else. Uh, all of these divisions uh, are not helpful, and in particular for children, because then they grow up that way. And, um, we as adults ought to understand our duty, and there comes a small c conservative value. We have a duty and a role to play when it comes to raising children, both as teachers and as, as parents. Uh, we're not meant to be friends with them. We're not meant to uh, make excuses for them. We're meant to make, take the hard road and to hold our standards high and to expect them to meet those standards. So people call me the strictest headmistress in Britain which is a bit of a silly name. But if you mm. type into Google, who is the strictest teacher in the world, my name will come up. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it was PR, isn't it? It works. Well, I don't know. I think it's the Sunday Times that once named me that. The strictest. That's how, yeah. I, that's what I've become. But um, How strict are you? Are you are you kicking off at them? Are you shouting? Are people scared? Because you're, you're, we were saying we're both taller than one another thought. Yes. This is a very tall podcast. Uh, <laughs> are you an intimidating presence in the, in the hallways? Well, no. In fact, I'm never in the hallways. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's so funny. I'm in my in my office all the time, talking to staff. Um, I'm rarely in the hallways. I'm having conversations like the one I just told you about. I mean, um, the thing is that people imagine that strictness means you're marching up and down the corridors with whips and chains and that you hate children. I get to school at 6.45 every morning. I clearly don't hate children. I wouldn't be doing that if I, did, if I hated them. I love them. Hmm. And I love the children so much that we hold our standards high for them. Strictness is love as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's much easier not to give the detention. It's much easier just to be friends with the kids, which is why adults do it. They don't give them the detention or they don't uh, uh, tell them off as the parent because it's easier to just push it under the carpet. And then they don't see over time how that builds up all kinds of trouble for you later on in life. And that when they're 14 and they turn around and tell you to F off and they want to listen to you, you think, oh my goodness, what do I do now? But it's too late. What you needed to do from when they were tiny was teach them that you are the adult in authority and that the buck stops with you. And that doesn't just mean that you tell them off. It means that you praise them. It means that you spend time with them. You bond with them. You get to know them. You love them. They must feel loved. They must feel like you are on their side. Mm. Otherwise, they're not going to buy into you. That's either as a parent or as a teacher. So it's so important. It's so important for people to understand this. Um, but that sense of duty, uh, so we have duties to all sorts of things and people. Uh, we have a duty to our profession, to do what, whatever job we do, to turn up on time every day, to be professional, to do it well. We have a duty to uh, our partners, our husbands, our wives, our mothers, our fathers, our brothers and sisters, and our children, you know, and those duties are all different depending on who you're, who we're referring to. Um, and that duty, there's a, responsibility that that brings on us, that we then understand the responsibilities we have and that we value them and that we deliver on them. Um, see, the problem with victimhood is that it means anything goes. You always have an excuse, well, it wasn't my fault, miss. You know, I come from a poor family. Oh, you know, I'm black. Mm. Oh, you know, I live on the estate. Oh, you know, I'm gay. I couldn't possibly have delivered the homework on time. And then the teacher is made to feel uncomfortable because her own privilege, she, I don't know what it's like to be poor. I don't know what it's like to not have a desk at home. I don't know what it's like when my dad not have a dad around. I feel bad for him. I'm not going to make him do his homework. Well, that's fine in the moment. You feel good about yourself because you feel as if you're being compassionate, just like the people who put black boxes up on Instagram feel like they're being compassionate. But actually, you're helping yourself in that moment. Because when that child leaves school, functionally enumerate and functionally illiterate, he's the one that's going to have to spend the rest of his life trying to make up for the mistakes that you have made uh, in somehow trying to be the most compassionate person possible. Mm -hmm. And that is... Um, 
that is where you, you see the selfishness ultimately, you know? When you try and live your life through a sense of duty and uh, taking on board responsibilities and not always just talking about your rights. My right is to get this. My right is to get that. But what are you responsible for? What do you have to deliver on, you know? Um, that is, I think it's an unhelpful way of seeing the world. I think that people end up with helps, uh, self-help books at age 45 when they haven't really found the meaning to life because they haven't had those values instilled in them from when they were younger. Um, to believe in something, to find purpose in life, instead of just thinking life is about making money and driving a fast car and getting a whole load of women or whatever it is. Um, it's about, I think, life should be about uh, giving back in some kind of way. Uh, so that when you're 90 years old and you look at your deathbed, you can say, I contributed. I did something mm. to make the, the world a better place. Built the bed. Yeah. No, built the deathbeds. No. I, I think about the deathbed sometimes. I think yes. like all, all of us have one out there, probably, waiting for us. Like, what do like, you mean, a, like a physical, it's... a physical. Well, you might just die in the street. Oh, oh, I see. But, but most I of see. us have. There is a, there is a bed that is probably going to be made in the future that, that yes. will be the one uh, that, on which you take your last breath. I thought about yes. that recently. It's just a horrible thought. I mean, that's a sidetrack, of course. It's not really related. To <coughs> well, you say it's horrible. Hmm. I'm not sure it is horrible. I'll tell you why. Hmm. Because imagine if you were to live forever, it would be a bit weird. Hmm. If you were just living forever, well, where, where's the you need to have a time span. You need to know how to frame it. There's a beginning, there's an end, and I've got this time to do this. If it just goes on forever, well, then there's no point in doing anything. But can't I mean, both be bad? It's, it's, it's not one has to, one, like, the dying good because living forever is bad. Dying's bad, but it would maybe be even worse if we lived forever. Well, there are only those two options. I mean, Shit. and not only that, look, dying early is bad, but if you've lived a good life and you have contributed and you've left children behind and grandchildren behind and you spent time with them. Now, you don't want to die in great pain, you know, so there are good ways to die and there are bad ways to die. They said di dying's not so bad, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> I don't know who said that, someone. <laughs> well, I think we definitely all want to be there because we want to die. We want to die <laughs> because, not too early, not in a terrible way, but it brings meaning to life. It that does. You need to have the bookends. You know? It does. It does. Well, speaking of meaning to life, so you were telling me that uh, your school got together to watch the England football or yes. soccer, as, as some people watching would know it. Yes. Or, or soccer. I can't do the Australian one, actually. I can do an American soccer. Mm. How does Australian or New Zealand sound? I have no idea. Soccer. Bit of soccer. I, mean, I, I think you might sound South African. Yeah. I, <laughs> bit of soccer, bit of, I don't know what they do. <laughs> anyway, can't do any accents. Um, yes. You had them around, and you were saying to me, this makes me really sad, that most schools, or, or maybe nearly all schools, would not have gotten everyone together, particularly from, from minority backgrounds, to watch the England game. Yeah. So we took the opportunity. It was on at five o'clock, so it wasn't too late. And um, we made a big deal of it, in particular because we have such a mixed uh, backgrounds of kids at the school. And what do we all share together? Well, we, we ought to all be supporting the England game. And at our school, that's definitely the case. But then we sing God Save the King. We are very much British together. And whenever there's the World Cup or the Euros on, we put England flags everywhere and we're always narrating the fact. When are we playing? When are we playing? You know, when are we, you know, we scored a goal and so on and so forth. And so we got all the kids in and, uh, well, we didn't get all, them, all of them in. The ones who wanted to come came, but I mean, it was far more than half of the school that came. You know, boys obviously more likely than girls, but uh, they were they had face paint oh. on there with the England flag. They brought their own flags. They wore their England shirts. Um, they stood up at the beginning in their various different classrooms, and they they were saying singing "God Save the King." And I mean, it was beautiful. It was absolutely lovely, um, and it was lovely precisely because we're all from different backgrounds. And I feel very strongly that. Um, school plays such a, an important role in socializing children and in making multiculturalism work. Mm. And I know there have been accusations in, you know, this year, last year, where people have said multiculturalism has failed. And I think that there is truth to that. I understand why people have said that. Um, because in many places it has failed. Um, it certainly doesn't fail at Michaela. And that's because you cannot just leave people from very different backgrounds and just put them all in one pot and say, get to it. Mm. Um, 
children need to be inculcated into something. They need to believe in something. And our common set of values, which I say are small c conservative values, um, allows them to share together and be together and be friends across religious and racial divides. Um, that should be uh, the desire of all of us. And should un we should understand that as adults, that's our role. Unfortunately, I find too many adults are doing exactly the opposite and dividing children by putting them into these different groups. And they think that that's what it is to be radical. That's what it is to... to uh, take on the establishment because the patriarchy and the, the the white men need to be brought down. Like I don't understand everyone's obsession with white men. Honestly, I'm really just, I don't understand it. Look, I mean, each one of us, you've got the cards that you've been dealt, right? Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are beautiful, some of us not so beautiful. Some of us are, are talkative, some of us very shy, some of us black, some of us white, you know? Uh, some of us are different religions, some of us not. Fine. You take your cards and you deal them. And I am not saying that there aren't issues out there that you might not come across issues. And in fact, I think white men for the first time in history are coming across those issues themselves where they themselves are finding prejudice and aren't able to get certain jobs or positions and are being turned down. And that is quite shocking to them because it's never happened to them before, historically speaking, I mean. And um, that's wrong. Just like it's wrong when it happens to black people, just like it's wrong when it happens to women and so on. Uh, and we shouldn't be... Those of us on the other side of the table shouldn't be campaigning for this to happen to white men because historically we're really angry. It's never happened to you guys. Therefore, it's your turn. Like, I mean, this is crazy. I don't know. I don't know how anybody has any time for this kind of anger. Yeah. My thing is always just let it go. Like, so friends of mine, for instance, will say, but don't you remember the 80s? Don't you remember the 90s? Don't you remember how difficult it was? And I say, yeah, I remember. But it's okay. Like, mm. I don't understand how people carry this weight it's on us. their show. Yeah, exactly. Just move on. Let it go. And then you'll be so much happier. You know, I just, I don't know. But you know, certainly the children growing up now, we need to be working on that to make sure that we are molding multiculturalism in such a way and, and looking after it so that it can succeed.